the sun is a magnetic star and every 20 years it changes the the it changes its configuration a uh, polarity and it varies the the emission of uh, the direction of particles in the the around or the planets and this solar cycle usually is approximately 11 years old solar cycle this is ups and down and during the down period of the solar activity when the sun is sleeping we have an increase of galactic cosmic rays that is a, another kind of ionizing radiation that cross the atmosphere and cross uh, our body and everything around us inducing biological responses that we still don't know some papers show that this is linked to mortality and morbidity, but more studies uh, we need. We are doing some studies about this too. So, and this is this is 11 year solar cycle. We have 22 year solar cycle. This is 11 plus 11. We also have uh, long term solar cycles that are more stable. And that is linked to also some periods of instability for Earth. And uh, yeah, and during this period, during the solar um, increased solar activity, we have we we found that we have some physiological responses that can affect our heart uh, function, immune, immune inflammatory responses, respiratory uh, outcomes, and other outcomes too. Eva, uh, this is the first paper I read of yours that uh, <laughs> looking at, at the risk to uh, cardiovascular disease. Yeah. So uh, how, how do you summarize that research? Yeah, in this research we investigated 263 U uh, cities in the USA and we found that solar activity during periods of high solar activity we have an increase of, of total and cardiovascular mortality rate and um, daily mortality and was very interesting because these effects were similar with the effects we found for air pollution and it, in a really short term uh, effect like at the same day because as our body is electric and all this variation that happened during solar activity increased solar activity is electric it produces electricity in the environment we are directly impacted and, and some studies show that our heart and brain rhythms are linked to the geomagnetic disturbances because Earth has a, a Earth magnetic field. And this magnetic field is driven, short term variations of this magnetic field is driven by solar activity. And when the solar activity increases, we have more geomagnetic disturbances that produce uh, it more el electric discharge and, and also magnetic disturbance that we are that penetrate our body and affect our electrophysiology from uh, the central nervous systems to other organs cardiovascular system respiratory system and I'm, I'm remembering that, uh, so we first met, as you well know, in an uh, eco-village in Brazil, where, where I am now, and you're back in Cambridge, and we got talking about some environmental education programs. When I was back in New York, where I teach, then uh, I was able to come up and visit you, and you told me a bit about this research. And one thing that you made so clear was that at the solar maximum, we would expect human beings to be more anxious, more angry, because there's very solid evidence that uh, the autonomic system is amplified during this time. Mm -hmm. And so then you were explaining to me about how you know, that works in, in some things uh, in terms of health. And what struck me, I started thinking uh, kind of in terms of social and political systems, that uh, what about revolutions? What about social movements? And then something that, that we've kind of, as we, as we went into this, well, well first I went home and I, into my Airbnb there in Cambridge, <laughs> And I did a little searching, and I looked at the great years of counter-systemic world revolution in the making of modernity. 1789, the French Revolution. 1848, the Spring of Nations. 1917, the Russian Revolution, all sorts of revolutions. Um, 1968, the Cultural Revolutions. And uh, 
um, more re 1989, the end of the Soviet Union, and some people say the autumn of, of nations, some people say the uh, spring of new democracies, and then of course 2011, which is a little kind of more in our recent history with uh, uh, the Arab Spring, Occupy Wall Street, and all these different mass mobilizations that all in different ways were um, going against uh, the, the so-called 1%. And so I went and looked. And, you know, and I was like, yeah, you know, that Carolina, I don't know what, what she's up to. And, and I went and looked, you know, because, because I, I, actually, I'm joking, that uh, I was very intrigued. <laughs> and sure enough, each one of those years was a solar maximum. Yeah. Now, that's not enough to, like, go out and say that the sun causes revolutions or anything. Yeah. But it was enough for us to think, well, let's do some more systematic research. Yeah. And uh, so then uh, we went and we assembled a really nice database of, reli of, of religions, of revolutions and social protest from 1901 to 2008. And you ran, you ran some early numbers and there was a ridiculous correlation that basically, you know, the, 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 revo the, the waves of revolution and protest followed the, 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 uh, the solar cycle. And I think that pushed our research a little deeper because it turned out that going back even to the early Soviet Union, there have been people who've noticed the sun and the timing of, of social unrest, but there hasn't really been good uh, system, systematic study. And, uh, but I think what we noticed was that for observers and scholars and participants in, in social movements and revolutions, that they tend to come in waves. They tend to come in cycles. And no one can really explain why. So of course, you know, the, the last hundred years, people have given all sorts of explanations. And the most uh, compelling, in my view, this is a more structural explanation that so many different localities are engaging with the same macro structural um, uh, structure. And so when, when that structure becomes, uh, um, when, when that structure loses an equilibrium, then we, we would expect to see more social mobilization in lots of places. And then there's also folks who look more at the mechanisms that how it is when one revolution or one social movement invents a new framework, invents a new practice, that then how it is that that idea might diffuse through direct or indirect contacts in the media or whatever it might be. And uh, so I don't think our research is saying that these are not mechanisms. And in fact, in the social science literature, it's very clear that there's the structural causes, the long-term changes in structure like um, demographics or economy that uh, um, and even you know even climate change that will start to make an un uh, uh, that will start to make a, a system socially and politically enter into disequilibrium mm -hmm. but it, then there's always a transient cause maybe a spike in food prices or hyperinflation which will then get people to the streets so you know it, it, there needs to be that wider structural cause but then there's some sort of transient cause and I think what, what we're, uh, what we're uh, maybe contributing to this is that there, there, there are environmental factors much bigger than anyone's been thinking of, that the sun might be a trigger for waves of revolution and social protest, and exactly for the reasons you were just talking about. That, so the structural conditions might be there, and there's always transient conditions always happening. The big question is, why 2011? Why 1968? The, the, these these uh, conditions have been have been right for quite some time, and so what our research is suggesting is that somehow the sun triggers human beings to be more anxious, more angry. It amps up, it amplifies our autonomic nervous systems, which then can push into the threshold to mass mobilization. And so we're not saying that these other things are wrong, but I think we're adding this environmental effect and uh, a cosmic effect that uh, really no one you know, in modernity has been thinking of, that somehow the sun would have such an effect on earthly endeavors. Yeah. And uh, so I, I kind of want to hit it back to you. Can you uh, kind of tell us, tell me a little bit more about how it is the sun might amplify the human autonomic nervous system? Like, I know it's not fully understood, but what's understood now? What's been measured? What are some ideas for the mechanisms? Yeah, the sun, in our, yeah, what we know by now is we have in our eyes some photo and magnetosensors that can capture 
uh, variations of electromagnetic radiation, that is a uh, radiation like visible light and other kinds of radiation that we are exposed to outside our body. So we can capture this uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation and magnetic fields variation, that is Earth magnetic field, in our eyes that we call uh, photo and magnetosensors. Um, there are many kinds of photo and magnetosensors. There are cryptochromes, a cry called cry uh, proteins that capture in our retina in 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 we and em, emit some electric informations to the super superchiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus. And in this area, this is the area that regulates our circadian rhythm. And uh, and circadian rhythm is not something it regulates from cell to organs to systems. So it, it changes everything in our body. If we have a, a dysregulation of this area in our brain, it is, tr is transmitted to the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system regulates, the, uh, for example, the cardiovascular function, all functions of our, of our systems. But uh, we can see in our cardiovascular uh, system that it can induce heart arrhythmia, increase uh, heart rate and accelerate, increase our blood, blood pressure. And all these symptoms uh, affect our sensations that something is uh, not going well. Although we, we think, oh, of course, in some, in some levels we cannot feel, but in, when it's increased too much, we feel uncomfortable because something is going on. And it generates anxiety. So some papers show that autonomic nervous system is linked to anxiety, and this regulation is linked to anxiety because people feel uh, indirectly, indirectly that something's not going well. And it, uh, I believe that also we try to find something that we, we've done in our life, but also something that can, is affecting us. And that push uh, people to do something more, or get more anxious and stressed, and and push them to maybe go to streets. This is a hypothesis, but this is something that can come from outside and affect our physiology and increase our adrenaline. That is something linked to autonomic nervous system too. That is sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous. And if we increase our uh, this regulation of our autonomic nervous system for example, can release more adrenaline and we can get more anxious and nervous and anxious and, and that can push us for to go to the streets and, and you know that <laughs> that's the, revolution. Our, our, our collaborator, Mitch Earlywine from the University of Albany, that he's a social psychologist and, and he's, you know, he's done research in, in, the, in the lab setting, which shows that how when anger, anxiety is amplified for one reason, that it can very much, you know, it very much does spread to other things. Mm -hmm. And that uh, uh, it's, it's kind of a, you know, in a sense, it's one of these common sense things, but they've shown they're very clear in the laboratory setting. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then uh, coming from the sociological setting, that it's very clear how the individual and the social kind of make this conversation back and forth. So, you know, the, the link isn't tough that when the entire social body becomes more anxious, mm -hmm. we're not going to expect revolution in Denmark. But we might expect revolution in a place which is very ripe for it, where the structural yeah. and transient causes are ripe. And we're also yeah. maybe not going to expect revolution in a place where the state just doesn't function. Yeah. Because people will only take to the streets and do revolution if they see that the government can respond. Yeah. Or that looking over the government will somehow help. Yeah. And so, for example, in um, a lot of post-colonial states where the government apparatus just doesn't function, that yeah. we, we, don't, we don't see it in the same way. Although yeah. certainly, you know, and this, this might be where we take the research, but then how does that anxiety play out in other ways? Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll certainly look how, how, how uh, famine and like when we, there is something material missing in our lives, like food, these things can trigger with autonomic nervous system and like and affect, it push us more than places where we don't have this as problems, basic problems. Um, social problems, economic problems. One direction I'm really interested to go, and I think it'd be much harder to measure, 
because in our study, you know, we've really tried to keep it a statistically meaningful study. So we brought in other sorts of variables, economic variables, climate variables, and then you know, sh showed to what extent is the sun part of this, uh, you know, part of this variability, and it turns out quite significantly. Something a little harder to measure, but I think would be fascinating, is uh, waves of religion. That, oh, yeah. uh, for example, uh, you know, there are there the so-called great awakenings in history. And, yeah. uh, and there are ebbs and flows of, of religious uh, activity. And so it'd be fascinating to see if, if there's some link with the sun. Yeah, it turns out wonderful. the older religions might have had it right, you know, that, about the sun. Yeah. Yogananda said that um, Yogananda is a, is a Hindu monk that came to, from India to America. And he said that uh, we capture cosmic irradiation from our spine and that activate, and I believe so. So maybe this is linked to not this, uh, cause, uh, solar activity, yes, because solar activity modulates other kinds of radiation that can penetrate Earth. Galactic cosmic rays, for example, that is higher energy than solar radiation. Yeah, since, since these things we, we can research, that is interesting. Uh, a little harder to research, but... Uh... A little harder, but maybe, <laughs> yeah. I think it's fascinating in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, and in so many traditions uh, that are that are more linked with the, the, you know, the, uh, an elemental understanding of the universe, that fire is always one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in Tibetan Buddhism, for example, earth, um, water, fire, air, space. Mm -hmm. You've already got the space taken care of. Yeah. And, uh, but but it, it'd be very interesting, you know, that how how some of these effects might speak back to some early earlier traditions. Yeah. It, we, we were just starting to play with some data this week looking at uh, labor stoppages. And, and there's going to be some uh, important significance there. But the, the study I really want to do, you know, if, if this study really, you know, I, I think our study is basically done now, we're just writing it up, but is to look in a place where there's more data available because we're looking at a global yeah. scale. And it, there's just not a lot of good data available on the global scale going back. Yeah. But looking in a place like France or the UK, which has kept very rigorous records for the last 150 years on yeah. all sorts of health and economic and political factors. And so I'm looking forward to maybe focusing in a bit That's and then be fantastic. able to do a much more rigorous kind of uh, look at some, at all the different variables which might go in. Because we do know that revolutions are not caused by economic things alone. Mm -hmm. That in fact, at the time of economic crashes is when revolutions least happen. Revolutions tend to happen after things went bad and they start getting better. Mm -hmm. But there's all sorts of other factors that, are, that are, uh, need to be present. And, you know, and we can look around the world. If it was just economic, we would see revolutions in all the parts of the world where there aren't revolutions, mm -hmm. where, where people are absolutely at the margins of the global economy, but we don't see revolutions there. Yeah. And uh, so the, the, anyway, It'll be interesting to, um, to try to focus in a little bit. There's, there's a couple things from the social aspect which really open up questions for me, which I don't think are easily answered, but that, uh, that I think are at least worth thinking about. That, for example, we know that those six major years of uh, world revolution, 1789, 1848, 1917, 1968, 2011, we know that um, you know, the, the, those transformed modernity. And in, in some senses, we can see those as critical moments of like shifting of what modernity would be. And, but if the sun um, conditions the rhythm of social activity to be these intense peaks, mm -hmm. which we see about every 12 years, and then some of those intense peaks are you know, world shifting, others are region shifting. For example, uh, 1979, 1980, a big year for lots of things, the Iranian Revolution, um, the rise of uh, Thatcherism in England, and, and of course the Reagan Revolution, all, all sorts of things happened in 79. And, uh, but we wouldn't necessarily say it was, it, was, it was a time of world revolution, but certainly 68, 89 were. But getting away from what I was trying to get at a little bit, that if human activity and human mass mobilization is conditioned in these short, uh, intense periods, how is that rhythm then conditioned the world that we live in versus if that factor hadn't been there and it would have been you know, maybe more stabilized. That, well, what do these intense moments do 
yeah. in the, you know, the creating of the structures that we live in? That's an open question for me. And then the final thing, of, of which uh, we have evidence to talk about in our paper, is our evidence is really clear. Yeah. That <laughs> every 12 years, there's a cycle of revolutions and, uh, and uh, social protest. And we think we have some idea what the mechanism is. We've taken out some other, you know, useful variables. And so what does that mean in the late 2024 when the next solar maxima will probably come? Because we're certainly living in a time of structural disequilibrium. And we're already seeing all sorts of transient causes coming at us all the time. Are we coming up to another moment you know, that our, our research would certainly suggest, almost demand that there's going to be some sort of cycle, 2024, 20, 25. Yeah. But uh, given the structural disequilibrium of the planet, the resurgence of nationalism, the, uh, um, the ecological crisis, the deterioration of the post-45 world order, they're, they're kind of endless. You know, all the, these major social disequilibriums that uh, are we coming in for another moment of kind of world-class so th th those are those are the things that uh, this research opens to me. But what are they open for you? <laughs> yeah, I, I I believe this is the way humans are evolving, because if you don't if you, if 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 you weren't exposed to anything and if we had a life without any peaks, probably we will we wouldn't be able to evolve all throughout these years, and and this and. This is the way, I wouldn't say fortunately or unfortunately, this is the way we need to have things changed, like um, going in through revolutions or through crisis, and that push people to change and to think about problems and solve problems. And, and we live in a planet that unfortunately, first, is not sustainable, and most of the people live in a poor conditions without safe and food and safe water and food so this is a not a sustainable place to live and of course we have we'll have from now many periods of uh crisis and revolutions to push humans to live in a place where people can live with similar conditions i wouldn't say the same because we are different but in a condition that we can live um uh, we can have at least the basic things to develop uh, and be also creative, cre creative about things because we can be creative, create new things, nice things without having food and safe water. So if we provide this uh, uh, dream, like planet for everyone, maybe we can have better solutions for everything and for everyone. So and I do believe this is the way that the things work, the the things working around us, the universe work to push us to evolve and evolve our physiology, evolve our our social, our society, and that's the way I think can help us.